Hello and welcome to Noble Mind. Noble Mind is a podcast exploring mindfulness, meditation, and psychology. Before we get started, I'm wondering how your stress levels are these days. Could you use a few extra minutes each week to decompress, chill out, relax? If so, then take note. Starting Wednesday, August 26th, we'll be offering Unwind, a free weekly drop-in practice session that will last about 30 minutes, just long enough, hopefully, to fit between all your other tasks and to-dos. Each week, we will give you a brief science-backed stress management or well-being enhancement morsel of wisdom. Then we'll spend 10 or 15 minutes leading a guided relaxation, meditation, or contemplation practice. Lastly, we'll end with a few minutes for discussion and personal connection. I started leading sessions like these last spring after the pandemic hit, and they've been great. It's amazing how relaxed you can get with just a few minutes of practice and how much we can connect as human beings even in the strange land of Zoom. So you can get more details and sign up to get the Zoom link and call-in information at noblemindpodcast.com. Hello, I'm Dr. Kate King. And I'm Alex Kukche. In this episode, we have the honor of talking to Dr. Stephen C. Hayes about his work as founder of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, and how ACT connects to mindfulness, spirituality, and challenges we face as a global community. Dr. Hayes also shares his thoughts on the biomedicalization of mental health problems, mental health stigma, his personal experiences with panic disorder, and much more. Stephen C. Hayes is a foundation professor of psychology at the University of Nevada at Reno and is the author of 46 books, including his new book, A Liberated Mind, and Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life, which for a time was the best-selling self-help book in the United States. An expert on the importance of acceptance, mindfulness, and values, he is among the most cited psychologists in the world, and his TEDx talks have been viewed nearly three-quarters of a million times. You can learn more about Dr. Hayes and join our email list at noblemindpodcast.com. We are so honored today to be speaking with Dr. Stephen Hayes. Welcome to Noble Mind. Well, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. And you are founder of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, as well as a prolific writer, researcher, and a real thinker, scholar, philosopher person. And most recently, you've written A Liberated Mind, which shares really some of your personal journey, your own kind of background and how you, what inspired the development of ACT. So I guess I'd love to hear anything you'd be willing to share about your personal journey and, and how, how ACT came out of that, really. Well, you're looking at a child of the 60s, an old man <laughs> who... Uh, you know, sat on Hippie Hill and the whole nine yards. And I was interested in how to do psychology in a way that was as basic and scientific as you could do, but then touched issues of meaning and purpose and peak experiences as a Maslow fan. And the whole generation, you know, that generation I was part of was trying to think about relationships and love and how to sort of break out of what felt like a a kind of a suffocating environment of the 50s and watching what our parents did. You know, I became part of the kind of CBT wing, behavior therapy kind of wing, but with that aspiration. And uh, I was fortunate enough to develop a panic disorder. It's If I hadn't, I probably just would have turned into a, a grant-getting, publication-writing machine. Mm-hmm. Turns out I've ended up as a grant getting publication writing machine. <laughs> it's a little different because I don't feel like it's a machine. I just feel like I'm just living, you know. But I, uh, in that kind of uh, self objectification, really, you know, treating myself as a horse to be whipped or something, I was fortunate enough to develop a panic disorder. And um, in unraveling that, had to revisit some pretty hellacious uh, spaces having to do with my family of origin and domestic violence in my home and seeing my dad suffering uh, and his alcoholism and 
what I didn't realize then was an anxiety disorder and my mother their obsessive compulsive disorder and depression, which again, I didn't know the names, but I knew something was wrong. And so the personal journey I've been on is to try to square the circle of how do we bring Western science, not just with the validation thing, like, oh, what the monks have been doing is helpful. That's great. You do that study, and then what's the next study? Do that again? Okay, well, then what's the next study? I was more interested in what are the processes that lead to human prosperity, or that if you mismanage, lead to human suffering. And um, the seeds of that are insider wisdom traditions, the seeds of that answer, I believe, because we've been at this for a long time, the scientists, the new kids on the block. And so the monks got there first. I mean, the spiritual religious traditions were there first. The mystical tradition was there first. And uh, there's a lot of wisdom there, but there's a lot of woo-woo in there. There's a lot of unnecessary hang-ons. There's ideas that don't hold up. There's, you know, etc. I mean, religious wars are real, and monks hit each other over the head about definitions of mindfulness. I mean, that's a fact. That actually has happened. So, uh, and I saw some of that in the excess of the 60s. So my journey has been a personal one, but also a professional one, a scientific one. And although you introduced me as the founder, in fact, and I will allow to people say I'm an instigator. I'm not the <laughs> developer because an entire community has done that. And the bonfire that's burning, I only threw a few logs on. So it's really far too grabby for me to claim credit for what has happened over a 40-year journey of trying to kind of hack the human mind and figure out what is inside our mindfulness traditions, wisdom traditions, spiritual traditions. And uh, why was it so, why is it so hard to be human? Why did I get to the point where I couldn't give a lecture to undergraduates? How did that come to be? That's what the act uh, work is about. It's not a, so much about a, here's a technique to use. It's more like, here's a set of principles and processes that we know are important. You had mentioned uh, there's woo-woo and then there's stuff that's good. H how do you discern the, the difference between those things? Well, you can't tell just by looking. I mean, the, the way most people would do it is you filter it by how it lands with you. The problem is, is that it's a package. And that's true everywhere you look. I mean, uh, although I'm out of the CBT tradition, turns out if you do component analyses, there's things that everybody here would say, oh, that's the core of CBT that are not very helpful. For example, detecting challenging, disputing, and changing difficult, irrational, dysfunctional thoughts is not why CBT works. Not. When you do component analyses and mediational analyses, these geeky scientific ways of filtering it, yes, it has something to do with cognition, but it's more a matter of cognitive flexibility, being able to think in different ways, look and see how that lands, pick what's useful, leave the rest. So, Theories are different than methods, and methods come as collectives. So if you have a particular guru, a particular tradition, a particular song or whatever, you've got a fruit and nut seed mix of things that are helpful, probably a few things that are hurtful. I'll give you an example if you'd like. Sure. And neutral things. Well, that's great. Fine. Okay. But it's not progressive. And the institution I'm betting on, this invention that's only really, I mean, the Greeks started it, but really, of Western science, experimental science, I'm betting on that. Because in the history of humankind, there's nothing, in my opinion, that's more progressive. Doesn't mean good. Progressive doesn't mean good. Nuclear bombs are not what you want in your backyard. But you'd never get there without Einstein. You'd never get there without physics. You'd never get there without science. This wouldn't be possible. And so when we watch what SpaceX is doing as they land the rockets and so forth, you're, you're looking at things that are fascinating, wonderful, incredible, and could be harmful. I think the same thing is true behaviorally. So my thing would say, yes, to personal experience, let's vet it first. Take it seriously. Don't pull it at the joints out of sacrilege. Do it out of interest in being able to simplify and to bring the essence to people on the factory floor. Because to be honest, uh, you know, 10 day silent retreats are wonderful and the educated elite mostly access them or the young. And you know, if you even go to the countries where this developed, the monks are doing that, not the normal people. They're giving alms to the monks to do that. So 
if I could figure out a way to do something, and I'll give you an example, give me a chance of, of in 30 seconds to do a little piece of what will happen in that 10-day silent retreat, then I feel like I've done something helpful to people. I think you said you had an example of... Yeah, uh, I'll give an example of a harmful one. Yes. Uh, if you're not an anxiety disordered person, you probably can get away with this. But the vast amount of our breathing retraining will produce hypocapnia. It'll produce CO2 levels in your blood that are too low and oxygen levels that are too high. You can measure them with a capnometer. They're expensive, but mostly in, in ambulances have them because you have to do it for cardiac problems. You can now get consumer versions. They predict, long run, what will happen inside your anxiety disorder. Big, well done, really good science says you don't want your blood gases out of whack. Every breathing training that's promoted that I know of produces the problem. And it won't blow up on you. You'll feel better. Why? Because as a panic disorder in person in recovery, I mean, anxiety comes from a root word that means can't breathe. And when you're really having a panic attack, you feel like, ah, ah, ah. no, breathe into a paper bag, you'd be better off. Raise your CA2. Don't lower it. Ah, ah. Because it's an evolutionary glitch in our brains that we feel as though we're suffocating when in fact what's happening is we have too much oxygen. Hyperventilation is the common one. I mean, every emergency room knows that. You know, if you come walking in with your, I've got a heart attack, and they watched your, you know, they say actually you're hyperventilating and you're having a panic attack. Mm -hmm. And they'll make you breathe into a paper bag. Here's the problem. There are no breathing retraining programs other than biofeedback linked to a capnometer that have been shown by science to reduce the blood gases when they're out of whack. Why? Because it feels like you're suffocating when you breathe in a way that brings that CO2 oxygen level back in harmony. If I go into a doctor and I get a little thing, it just happened again, I look at my lab report, my CO2 is too low. Well, because I'm a panic disordered person in recovery, I will never breathe normally. And I have not gone through the biofeedback training, but I read the science. So, but by how many people will like chest thump and say, you know, you're not doing it right unless you're belly breathing with deep breath. No, I mean, it feels good. It even works well if you're not in the at-risk group. If you're in the at-risk group, it's like, no, don't do that can't open up, you know, a magazine without seeing it advised. I bet you some people are listening to me right now are saying, no, that can't be true. That's wrong. That's certainly wrong. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, Google Alicia Moret, uh, Southern Methodist University and her work, a really good scientist out of the CBT tradition, but who also works with asthma and other things where breathing really matters. I think the data are undeniable. Uh, anybody who's scientifically able we'll be able to read it and say, by golly, we better be more careful about that breathing, retraining advice. And even the focus on the breath as something to come back to in meditation and mindfulness also, I think, becomes quite problematic for anxiety. Exactly. Now, let's say you have a breathing issue, as many anxiety folks do, that's the etymology of that word. And now you're focusing, you don't, it's like focusing on how to walk. If you ever try to walk on a four inch wide a beam, well, put it on the ground, you can do it. Put it 10 feet up, you're almost impossible. Put it 50 feet up, you've got to be trained to do that because your mind's screaming at you and you actually literally forget how to walk. Uh, you know, you start getting unstable in ways you never would just walking across the room, right? Well, the same thing with breathing. You focus on it and you have relaxation-induced panic, breathing-focused-induced panic. Go look at the literature. And so... Never mind folks who have some obsessive traits, the same kind of thing. You know, am I breathing right? Am I breathing right? Pretty soon you almost forget how to do it. So um, I'm not busting using breathing as a focus in meditation, although I like the fact that we can do things like Nurbe Singh's work with the developmentally disabled folks and children that you can use yourself. It's in a liberated mind. F focus on the soles of your feet it's less likely to produce that kind of focus. Plus, you can actually talk while doing it. There's some nice things about that that's a little harder with follow the breath. 
but follow graph has you know, worked pretty well. And for most people, it's pretty darn good. And yeah, I'm fine with it. It's just when you know the processes, let's have a broader range of ways that we can get at that process and be humble enough to see what science tells us about how to dial that in for particular people. Can I clarify something? Are you saying diaphragmatic breathing is not helpful or is it only for panic disordered folks? Here's the way to measure it. Buy the capnometer, you can get it for 500 bucks. Try your normal level, then try your diaphragmatic breathing. My guess would be you probably are actually increasing your level of oxygen and decreasing your level of CO2. Is that a problem? No, not in and of itself because it's a matter of balance. But you cannot trust your personal feeling because there's an evolutionary glitch in how the brain reads blood gases. How do I know that? When you actually hyperventilate, you feel like you need more oxygen. That's a fact. So I am saying it's dangerous. Yes, I am. I'm saying it's dangerous. And I think it's an empirical fact. I mean, I'm not saying it because I did the research. I'm just saying, go look at the research. And you'd say people can be harmed by that. So, and the people who were developing it, sitting under the trees and doing yoga and doing the things they're doing, you don't know Buddha was not a scientist. Don't be telling me that. Don't be telling me that Christ was a scientist either. Not Western science. Was it based on experience? Yes. But all religious traditions are based on experience. That's not enough. Organized with controls, Western science can is the only thing that can pull those things apart that I know of in the human traditions. And so, boy, this is a bad thing to say on a mindfulness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting myself in big trouble. <laughs> but uh, so We'll forward you the hate mail. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. I, gotta, I don't want to run into the room and throw a smoke bomb. It's not even my work. I just, I just say, here it is, here's my work, is... Let's use Western science for what it's best at. And to me, that's understanding the processes of change and to do it respectfully, take it seriously, look at what's out there in the wisdom traditions, but then test them in an analytic way that follows processes of change and is linked to components and leaves something new that isn't the whole thing because the whole thing includes lots of things that are probably just going along with it. And some things that are under some conditions are probably harmful. Every other human tradition unguided by science is like that. And science itself takes a long time to weed these things out. I mean, how many times you look at the nutrition advice and you go, oh my goodness, if that's <laughs> stuff I was told to do is now they realize are bad. <laughs> this is a, yes, that's the way science is. It keeps self-correcting, self-correcting. So the scientists have to be humble, even about what they think they know. Maybe this very finding could be flipped. I would love to have, and Alicia would, a way of instructing breathing training that would avoid this problem. To to my knowledge right now, we don't have one. Maybe a clever person doing yoga and breathing training with camnometers can figure this out in a way that we can then read a magazine or, or go to a class and know how to do it. Feedback, biofeedback will do it. Variation and selection. Individuals will find a way to breathe in a way that bring their blood glasses. But that's with the uh, assistance of uh, biomedical readings being continuously given to you. Yeah. A lot of people have made connections between ACT and other various wisdom traditions. I know you've written a little bit about ACT and Buddhism yourself. And I'm wondering if there are areas where you see the strongest convergence or divergence? Like where does ACT go that sort of contradicts or is different than those things? Or, or where do you see the greatest synergies? Well, I like getting a little more Catholic with a small c on this. I've written a little bit about Buddhism, which I did later because I was asked to. I mean, to the extent that my training, yes, I was exposed to Zen Buddhists and so forth as a child of the 60s. Joshu Sasaki Roshi wrote, he came over from Japan, a major, he's dead now, but in one of his first uh, lectures, I, he, he was in Los Angeles and was about to help form the um, what I think became the Los Angeles Zen Center at the time. It was called the Cimarron Zen Center. 
you know, I saw one of his early lectures, you know, so that I'm kind of out of that. And I lived on a religious commune for a period of time that was based on an offshoot of Hinduism. So those Eastern things are in all the hippies of my age. They just are. We read Suzuki and Watts and all that. But were we really Buddhists? No, we were just explorers, you know, and a lot of what we knew, we knew through the the uh, quick shortcut of psychedelics, I mean, which is a very sloppy way to get oriented. It turns out it's useful, and actually psychedelic therapy and act are married up right now. Some of the large trials are doing it. But I always like pointing out that every single major religion has a mystical wing. And by the way, the founders are almost always inside that wing. Before they started talking about dogma and methods, they had spiritual experiences. And how did they do it? In all cases that I know of, they did it by messing around with analytic, judgmental, linear, problem-solving language. Whether it's silence or chanting or dancing or koans, or repeated prayer, or meditation, or focus, or opening the focus, or following the breath. And, it, and what that tells me is, and the very first paper ever written on that, 1984, was called Making Sense of Spirituality. And I'm a behaviorist, I'm even a behavior analyst, I'm a neo Skinnerian, strangely enough. And it was published in the journey Behaviorism, of all places, where I'm trying to un- unpack the fact that, you know, the large percentage of the human population say that spirituality matters and they've had spiritual experiences themselves. And spiritual experiences are always marked by some sort of sense of connection across time, place, or person that's unusual. Oceanic awareness, feeling of oneness, timelessness, spacelessness, always. Well, you know, the mindfulness traditions the meditation traditions, the wisdom traditions of all the major religions, the Christian mystics, the Sufis, the Kabbalah folks, I mean, it, all of them, it's not just b- the B word, are coming up with methods to mess around with analytic, judgmental, problem-solving language and to put it on a leash and allow more of us, some of it's not that's not even in language, to show up and then the part of us of language that's in language that is able to observe and describe and appreciate. The part of you that knows full well to look at a sunset and say, wow, and then shut up. You don't say, wow, too much blue. You just don't. <laughs> right. If you listen to the suffering of a child, you say, wow, and then you don't say, snap out of it. So our wowfulness slash mindfulness processes are they're already within us. And the wisdom traditions have figured out a way to sort of, you know, bell the cat of analytic judgmental problem solving mode of mind and foster a broader connection to us as whole human beings with intuitive felt sense, etc. plus wowfulness, plus mindfulness, plus flexible attention to the now from this I hear now as point of view that can be deployed in such a way that you get to focus on what's important and leave the rest. That's the act model in a sentence. And it turns out, I think it's inside all the mystical wisdom traditions. The one thing that we add, analytic Western science to figure out what the processes are, measure them, figure out how you can move them with little micro methods, et cetera, number one. Number two, figuring out how to put into our health system, et cetera, the parts that sometimes get leave behind, which is the mindfulness processes get disconnected from the values and behavior change processes that are in there when they're done spiritually. Right action is always in there. But you can't come coming in with your stress management program and say, here are the values. You're not a spiritual leader. You're a healer or a helper or a health. So in the West... We're now producing selfish mindfulness. You take care of the kids. I got to go meditate. <laughs> uh, oh, well, really? Did we have an agreement on that? Or I worry about that. I worry about the westernization of the wisdom traditions unguided by the processes that orient us towards how do we really produce lives that are liberated, that are avoid the cul-de-sacs and empower people to climb the hills they want to climb. 
When you say westernized, do you mean imbue with individualism, capitalism? Absolutely. Commercialism? Definitely that. I mean, I literally saw a, a mindfulness burger on a menu. Oh, no. <laughs> literally. <laughs> so, of course, we can trash it that way. But I also mean, in addition to the individualism and so forth, I mean, don't trust that attentional flexibility, emotional openness, cognitive flexibility, and this witnessing sense of self. You know, John Kabat-Zinn's definition, but I'll add the self word, but in the special way that's not the finger pointing at the self, but the fromness of awareness. Don't trust those four only to extend out through compassion and so forth to others and then land in values and values-based action. I don't trust it if we don't do the work. Now, usually it does happen, and we have to have data on that. We really actually, we've, we've done several studies, but in fact, there's a new one just came out, Journal of Effective Disorders. It's not my team. It's not, it has some ACT stuff in it, but it's not really an ACT-y one. Acceptance and mindfulness training with depression or acceptance and mindfulness training with depression and values work. You know, it's kind of obvious which one's going to win, right? <laughs> yeah, the values work and everything works better. But is that what people are necessarily learning when we take mindfulness out of the spiritual and religious traditions in which your ability to speak to values is acknowledged because I've come to you as a leader or a spiritual guide versus what you would find, let's say, in an eight-session program at work or in your wellness program? My guess is values aren't being talked about unless they've been reading some act stuff or they come out of the wisdom traditions and they're finding a way. Because I'm not saying we're adding anything. It's not already there. I'm just saying don't forget that it was there for a reason. And if you go to a 10-day silent retreat, they probably have you doing sometimes some walking meditation and they'll have you cleaning the dishes mindfully. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because that's, you know, I mean, what are the monks doing? They're not, they're, they're working together. They're growing plants. They're, do you know what I'm saying? Uh, it isn't just sitting. I'm doing long rants. I'm an old man. It gets worse every year. In A Liberated Mind, you write touchingly and openly about your struggles with panic, consequences of your exposure to domestic violence, other adverse childhood experiences, other things that you've struggled with. And I also had a difficult childhood, so it was especially meaningful for me. And also seeing how you explicate, you're very open about the difficulties and you explicate your process. Yeah. Which... I think for, for many people who face similar situations or situations that ACT addresses is both validating, oh my goodness, this, this horrible thing that I lived through, and it's not just me, and here's an intelligent way to approach it. There, there's a way through it. Yeah. And you also write about the prevalence and harmful impact of mental health stigma. So the question I had was, is, was there a point in your career where you decided to begin to share more openly about those things? What informed that decision? Well, my own struggle with panic was shrouded with secrecy. I mean, even my colleagues didn't know. When Rosemary Nelson, the important behavior therapist, one of the first female president of the Association of Advancement Behavior Therapy, which not changed its name, but the big CBT society, and my, my close colleague, when I actually started talking this way, she said, what? By then, I'd left Greensboro where I was with her. Like, I hid it from people who were as close as you could be with without being uh, married to them practically and even even that i, I mean i tried to ha hid things from my wife and so you know part of the way that this stigma works is that you internalize it and you apply it to yourself it's, it's self-stigma and it's that's the most harmful even an acted stigma being a receptive to stigma it turns out Mindfulness and values is a prophylactic for protecting the worst impact of that, mm. I think, because you're able to sort of not then do it to yourself. But so it starts, I think, with realizing that the same voice that's telling you to run, fight, hide is telling you that you can't allow other people to see because then they won't want to be with you. And we're the social monkeys, you know, we want to belong. It is so important. I mean, love 
isn't everything. It's the only thing. I mean, we really, it's at that level. And so it turns out when you're able to give responsible voice, do the work, don't dump it on others. We're not talking about a dump and run. You solve my problems. Mm. No, you get to speak and share inside the journey of you dealing with it. And you can ask for help, but no fair dumping. When you do that, people come to you. They don't run away from you. Your mind says they'll run away. It's the exact opposite because guess what? The biggest secret of all the secrets that we have that we're carrying around is that we all have the same secrets. And because we don't share, we don't know. And we compare our insides to other people's Instagram outsides. And that's a train wreck. It's crushing our children. If you just look at what's happening, I mentioned Instagram, if you just look at what's happening inside a world in which you can see the gold-plated doorknobs of billionaires' bathrooms, you can compare your insides to the wonderful things that are happening to your friends according to their pictures, and then you put duct tape over your mouth and you don't speak the truth. You know, you see anxiety, depression, and all the rest explode. And that's what we've seen because you're feeding unhelpful processes. So uh, the place that I began to get more public is the place when I became pretty clear I could do it responsibly. I'm sharing, I'm not dumping, and I'm asking. I'm doing that for a reason to invite community and connection and, and to be helpful. Uh, you know, I'm a therapist, so, but I think also, you know, beyond one of the things that has to happen in the, inside the stigma, we've gotten so used to thinking of its mental illness and the deismization and biomedicalization of human suffering that happens inside that. And then, Oh, one out of five of us have that problem. Well, that's just a lie. Yes, one out of five maybe are diagnosable in some way. But what that message is, is here's the poor people who are suffering, and we four don't. That's a lie. It's only because we're not speaking about our own inner life. If you do that, and boy, is the COVID the time to remind people of this. It's five out of five. It's not one out of five. Is there anyone who's not afraid right now? Is there anyone who's not worried about what's happening in our world right now? Are you awake? So what are you going to do with that? Good question. You know, I would say let's focus on the smallest set of processes that do the most work first. And it turns out they're in our mindfulness traditions. They're in that ACT model, these psychological flexibility processes that are in a liberated mind. They're kind of a hack, really. I mean, they're not everything, but boy, they're a lot. Mm. When I work with students, I often grapple with this issue because there's a, you're sort of working with people when they're early on in their career, just, you know, starting to be a therapist and there's a wanting to not perpetuate the mental health stigma, but then there's also these real power differentials that happen if people say things on an interview or in a classroom and other people stigmatize yeah. them. So I don't know if you have any thoughts or guidance that you offer to students or mentees or people you work with about how to make that choice about what to share or not to share. When are you perpetuating the stigma and when are you? And you have to notice context as well. You know, one of the ironies, and it's kind of a torturous one for me in a way, is the, the more visibility you have, et cetera, the more freedom you have to share these things. I mean, just look at the social impact. When I see that, you know, I don't say, boy, you just need to be dumping your insides to the outsides to folks who I know in the context that they're facing. For example, let's just take gender bias. Men can get away with openness in a way that women can't, even though women are more attuned often to these kind of emotional things because they have better training, really, frankly. I mean, men are taught suppression methods, etc. Women are often taught to kind of notice emotions in ways that men are just dumb about. I mean, look at alexithymia, let's say. The I don't know answer. Ask my wife. You know, <laughs> men say, I don't know all the time when you ask about what they feel, what they feel, what they want, what they because we're just stupid because we've been, you know, out there kind of deliberately ignoring. And if you deliberately ignore it long enough, eventually you just don't know. And so I would say to 
students, and for example, to really within yourself with friends and family and people who are safe, create a space in which you can be yourself freely and openly. Allow yourself that exploratory space. And then test the waters in a responsible way. When, you, when you're doing the work and you, and you don't feel compelled, you don't have to say it. Well, let me give you an example in doing clinical work. You know, early on when I'm walking out of my panic disorder thing, I realized if I just told people I was uh, I had a tendency towards panic and I sometimes get anxious and stuff, that really kind of opened up space. So I'd give a talk and say, by the way, you know, I actually have a panic disorder. And then I realized about three months later, I was doing it as a control move. <laughs> I was doing it as another round of the same crap, you know. <laughs> If I say it, then they won't, they won't judge me. And if they don't judge me, then I'm a... <laughs> And I could actually do things like, so then I started doing this. I started deliberately not saying it. And then I added in some stuff. I'll deliberately not say it. And I will engage in some motor behaviors that really would be read as anxiety. So I would, <laughs> on purpose, just to say, you know, the mind's telling you can't go there. I'm going there, you know, where it's just a poke in the eye, you know, or a pull on Superman's cape, you know, where that part of you that says thou shalt not tell anyone can also say you have to dump and tell everyone. Well, freedom means I can be silent. I can speak. I can do it here and not there. Well, based on what? Well, based on what I'm trying to do, where am I come from? What is this motivated by? What is this about? How is this likely to land? And what is this intuitive spidey sense we get just from living and loving about is this helpful in this moment to the people around me and to the interests that I have in this moment? And when you do that, I, then there's no rule book answer to the question, but there is a read answer. The internal read of I could, I'm free. So now it's not a compulsion in any direction. And then the external read of how would this serve what I'm trying to do in this interaction right now? And respectfully, I may decline my mind's invitation to talk about my history at this moment because I know it's not going to serve it and the person may misunderstand it. And conversely, respectfully, I may choose. I mean, the late Albert Ellis used to go on national television and eat peanut butter sandwiches. And I think that's kind of cool, <laughs> not as a compulsion. I would never say that's the rule. Don't get on Oprah and bring out your peanut butter. But that, <laughs> that you could do that? Right. Awesome. <laughs> mm, freedom. Huh? In uh, A Liberated Mind, you present act with the addition of a metaphor of a pivot. Well, mm. six pivots. So I wonder if you'd like to say a few things about that. Yeah, that's that's an innovation in the book, but and it's changed my thinking so profoundly, just profoundly. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in there, I realized we always had these six processes as, as inflexibility processes, and then we had the pair of flexibility processes, and they were paired. Experiential avoidance and acceptance, cognitive entanglement or, or fusion and defusion, so forth, if you know the ACT model. What I realized somewhere in there is there's a deep yearning. There's a motivation that's inside pathology. And process by process, it's the same motivation across the pairs, not in a real hard divide way. I mean, psychological flexibility is six things that are three things that are one thing. You know, it's that soft. And it really functions that way in terms of the underlying measurement uh, dynamics, for example. You can push them out into six processes, but it's just like six sides of a box. You know, you don't have a box without six sides. If you eliminate three sides, it's no longer a box. In the same way, psychological flexibility is one thing, but it also has six aspects. Let me give an example that really fits the mindfulness part. If you think about those times where you felt especially close, where you looked in the eyes of your loved one and you felt deeply interconnected, yeah? I bet you can find times where you almost blend in a way, but not in a way that's like unhealthy. It's not like an absence of barriers. It's like a we. It isn't just 
me and thee. There's an actual connection. Well, we are the primates that have that experience beginning even before human language. Neonates, brand new, looked at by kind eyes, dump natural opiates in the brain. And they need to because they're so dependent upon the love and caring of the giants around them that they would die within days left to their own devices. They're not like a baby deer who's going to jump out and run away. They're helpless, yeah, but they have that smile and they have those eyes and they, right? And mama's or dada's brain is dumping natural opiates too, yeah? That gets built out in perspective taking, I and you, here and there, now and then. And somewhere around three years old, we've done the basic research on this. How do we know this? We have children who don't have a sense of self of being behind their eyes. Who are you talking about? Autistic spectrum disordered children. And we can train them with the cognitive methods to be able to go behind the eyes of another. Now with these cognitive processes of I, you, here, there, now, then, these perspective taking. And I talk about that in a little bit more vibrated mind. It builds out on where we started as neonates with this wonderful tool we invented of human language that I think is an extension of cooperation and actually where it came from. That's another story. A core part of mindfulness is to sit inside this witnessing I hear now self and learn these emotional, cognitive, and attentional flexibility skills. To focus and catch your mind, water, bring the puppy back, wanders, bring the puppy back. Yeah, but who's noticing? It's not the self as categorized. It doesn't have attributes. It's simply being, pure awareness, not even of anything, right? When you look at someone else and you feel deeply interconnected, what you're doing is you're connecting with that little piece that got built out from where we started as neonates, and you're seeing that you're being seen, and you see that you're seeing that you're being seen, and you see that the other person sees you and sees you seeing them. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, now here we go to my point with the pivots. Mindfulness creates a a deeper sense of belonging Mm. because you're tapping into a skill that will connect you in consciousness to others or in awareness or in beingness. We don't have words for it, really. And yet, what is the opposite of that sense of self? I'm great. I'm grand. I'm so wonderful. You need me because I'm the best. Or, I'm so sad, I'm so pathetic, help me, help me, (laughs) let me in. Both are routes to belonging, but they're through what? Through claimed specialness. But if you're special, you're different. And if you're different, those eyes are not the same, yeah? So the mind will give you a quick cheat to get a sense of belonging and being in the group by doing what will exclude you and keep you out of the room. If you're a narcissist, you're lonely for life. I think we have an international uh, example of that on our television screens nightly. This is not happy. This is not connected. This is not belonging. It's the cheap thrill of you need me followed by do you and who am I anyway? So I'm sorry for such a long answer. And pivots have allowed me to, to say, What you're doing that's pathological at its core is your ally. Mm. It's interesting because people talk a a fair amount about the loneliness epidemic. And that's a thing that gets tossed around a lot. And some people talk about narcissism as also an epidemic in a way. But you've just sort of built a bridge between the two in a very clear way. Well, you you know, loneliness is not predicted by social isolation or presence. It is, if you're socially isolated, you're more likely to be alone. But the epidemic of loneliness is happening inside large cities as you're walking across the crosswalk with scores of other people who are also lonely and who look down in a way rather than look at you when you walk across the street. And you'll do the same. Just watch where your eyes go when you walk across the street. You don't look at the people walking towards you. I really don't. <laughs> in fact, worse, you look down in a way because you dare not connect 
that might be a crazy person, that might be something that wants, that might be a dangerous person, that might be, so we build these kind of cocoons around us, and then we do it in our claims of specialness and our self-aggrandizing thing or our kinds of pathology, and we suffer as a result. So can we take our knowledge of what doesn't work at the level of process, what does work at the level of process, and if we see these common motivations, we can say to somebody, you're not broken. There's, you're not, there's not something wrong with you. What you want is worth your attention. It's just you can't get it that way. I would like to be able to have that conversation with the narcissist to draw them into another form of connection that would be more soul-satisfying. I don't know if I'd be given permission. They don't come to therapy except when their relationships fall apart. That's what Brian, somebody else told, tells them to go. Some key aspects of a pivot is that, as you point out, they take the energy inside an inflexible process and redirect it towards yeah. a flexible one. And also, this change could happen in an instant. Yeah. So that's really hopeful. So what we perceive as intractable problems contain the energy for flourishing. Well, the data on that are so clear. You do work in trauma. You know how, many, how much data is there on trauma-induced uh, growth and prosperity. Most people without therapy will actually find forms of prosperity by trauma. I have to be careful saying this out loud because, of course, if trauma has been crushing you, you feel like, oh, why, why am I the one? You know, okay, I get that. Well, part of it might be, what did you do with that pain? Can we work together? And so you look at, for example, what are the, the things that happen inside, let's say, an abuse history, and then you step up and care about children who are suffering and are being abused. What's happened in Me Too? What's happening right now with anti-racism? You know, that we're in, in an awakening where that pain can be put in a different direction. If you suffer, you're the lucky ones. Because there's another form that's even worse called uh, being numb. Mm. And the happy numb is not happy. And by the way, the over-medication of the world that we've done inside the biomedicalizing of human suffering... You can interrupt a depression cycle, but you know, if you actually measure joy, you could market the antidepressants as anti-joy drugs. Their effect size on joy is about the same. Their effect size on the lowest of the low. Because what you're, what you're doing there is not the evolutionarily sensible adaptation. Those feelings are there for a reason. It'd be like fixing a car by turning off the warning lights. Now, I don't want to be, you know, as a panic disorder person in recovery, you know, who took their beta blockers and anti-anxiety just drugs, even after ACT developed, I wrote a blog about licking the pills. You know, the last talk I gave, right, I licked the beta blocker before going on stage. And finally, I said, okay, enough already. Because <laughs> I kept trimming and, trimming and trimming and trimming. And eventually, you know, it just wasn't relevant. So I'm speaking not in a judgmental up here way of saying thou shalt not use medications no we've actually done act to help people prescribe medications for things like drug and alcohol abuse for example where the data are pretty good but but let's do it with open eyes one out of four women last year were on antidepressants in the united states of america that's insanity there's no meta-analysis ever done that says that makes sense and some of folks will be on those medications for life. 60% will have sexual side effects. On and on you go. So, you know, we have turned, we use the language of mental illness to turn a billion dollar industry on our culture in a way that is actually actively, oh God, now I'm really going to get in trouble. But, I, you know, I think it's gone way too far. There's a role, but not. So you're the lucky ones. The happy nuns are not happy. You point out that pain and purpose are two sides of the same thing. Yeah. And in your book also, you write about in more detail how ACT principles can be applied to social change, Yeah. to prejudice, to abuse. Very hopeful. That, that's happening right now. You know, that people are using, and of course, that's been in the mindfulness traditions from the beginning. It, it has. It's just a, uh, a really important social form of that, that 
you know, if you flip over your pain, you'll, you'll find purpose. And if you connect with your purpose and do it in a really open way, you know, I'll use the example of relationships. You know, when I work with folks, I ask them to slow it down. And when you connect in love with anyone, if you listen really carefully, there's a tiny little voice that says, run away, that says, defend yourself, that says, watch out, that says, this will end, that says, this might not be real, that says, it would be awful if I lost this. Yeah. And it's a whisper or it's a felt sense. Yeah. But it's actually not your enemy. Because you can use that sense of woundability to open your heart if you breathe in the loss, not when it happens only, but now. I'll give you an example. You're going to die. And if you love someone, one or the other of you is going to die first. And the person left behind will feel abandoned. Okay? Can we breathe in that loss? And like a yo-yo, you know, you, when it pulls towards you and then you, you take that energy <laughs> and then put that energy into how precious this moment is. You with me on that? Absolutely. This is death meditation. It's a very similar experience. Yeah. Well, the wisdom traditions are on to it. Of course. Of course. Because this is just the human condition. But when, you know, the Western world sometimes wants it only in the positive flavor. Okay, you're, well, you're going to have life without death? Is it really? Uh, you know, that's really, the usually ends up being the nightmare version, you know, like Voldemort. I mean, <laughs> the artists and the movie makers and so forth know full well. We know full well. You're really on the edge of something that's harmful to the human soul to do that. So let's put it into that, and that's that pivot where you take even the the, the, the sadness that you feel at loss, you know, like take the time. I was just doing something on an online course I was doing with a person who's struggling with this and the vulnerability of love. And we went inside what she did with her dog and her kids loving that dog so much and how precious her dog had been to her when she was going through a difficult divorce and now had been married again, had a baby, etc. And we really walked through the burial and the honoring and the sadness and the appreciation and the laughter of the funny things that happened and the softening that comes. And inside that, loss is your ally to love because it will soften you. So there's an example of a pivot. I was just thinking also that your act, uh, Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life, has the, the sort of now classic exercise of writing your own eulogy. And yeah. I think of that as a, as a more values-based thing, but it totally connects to what you're saying now, too. Totally connects. They're all interconnected. And yeah, it's a motivation. How do I want to spend my moments? But it also invites you into softening, opening up emotionally, because you can include pain you know the poets the gibrons of the world and so forth talk about how there's a scooping out that happens with your openness to pain and sadness that then allows you to pour love and joy into it and that you don't get a drop more not a drop more than what you've scooped out by being open to pain and i think that's right this is not sadism and masochism this is being open to the whole of human experience. And if we can practice that and learn that and, and, and one step at a time, none of us are, you know, fully open to all our experience. I mean, the Dalai Lama says he occasionally gets irritated at things. He's been meditating for 50 some years. I mean, so we're, and none of us are getting close to, you know, come on, <laughs> but can we, open up, open up, open up, and allow life to scoop out a space in our hearts that allow us to fill that space with what brings meaning and purpose and connection and contribution to us. Now, many of our listeners are fans of meditation, mindfulness, other third-wave interventions. 
like EMBSR, MBCT, DBT, mindful self-compassion, compassion focused therapy. Now, how do you see the relationship between those and ACT and how do they relate? How do they intersect or diverge? Well, they're all interrelated. Uh, I think of ACT as a way of targeting psychological flexibility processes. So if you take something like compassion focused therapy, you know, we're not trying to grab it, Paul Gilbert's work or something like that. But if you were to come to an ACT conference, you're going to see all kinds of so-called ACT conference. Mm-hmm. We don't even name our association. We call it Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, not the Association for ACT. Right? But if you go there, you're going to see lots of CFT folks. But you're also going to see lots of folks using the psychological flexibility model to orient them in therapy. And they see that acceptance has an extension into compassion that occurs naturally as part of a values-based journey. I cannot be open to my emotions and be closed off to yours without messing around with basic consciousness processes. I have to shut down myself to keep you out. Mm-hmm. We keep running into this in, in the data, you know, like, like that caring about others includes perspective taking, empathy, and emotional openness. All three have to work together, yeah? So you need to go behind the eyes of another and then to open up to what it's like to actually be there. And then if you find pain there, out of that values-based journey, uh, intend for that suffering, pain is not just suffering, pain is more than, but suffering at least, intend for that to, to be alleviated. So the answer to your question is, all of the evidence-based processes that really help should be available to us as therapists. Models that orient us towards processes that change are the most important. Methods or ways to move those. And would I want an open range of methods? Yes. So I don't think of ACT as a protocol. There's so many different things. I don't see a set of set techniques. I don't see it as something I developed. The whole community has developed it and is developing it right now. I just instigated it. I lit, I lit a match. I didn't bring the logs, just a couple. So over time, I predict all of the names for therapies that tend to be technique-oriented and boundary-producing will fade away as we as a scientific and helping community learn to focus on processes of change that liberate people. So I care more about the psychological flexibility model. If you're doing work that is deliberately oriented to move that, you have my absolute permission to call it ACT, no matter what it contains, if there's data showing that it moves those processes. If you don't want to, and you're like, I want to build, don't, great, you have my permission. At the end of any long workshop, I would say, by the way, you can take these methods, slice them, dice them, combine them, and use them in anything you want. We don't certify therapists, and we don't trademark our methods. And do it out of a values-based space. Don't just do it to build a, you know, a castle you can pee on and say, mine. that's mine. <laughs> do it because that way of speaking will, will be of use to others. We are the wing, not the only one, that has really done the hard work of working on these processes of change. ACT was developed in the 80s, wasn't written about to the end of the 90s. And we spent 15 years in the desert, working out processes of change, a theory of cognition that works, there are whole hundreds of studies now on how to bring children forward in cognition, et cetera. If you get interested in ACT and read a liberated mind, you'll see it. And so what I'm able to bring to the third wave in mindfulness community is here is a set of vetted scientific processes. It's not fixed. It's still changing. Let's work it out. But these are a helpful small set and consider the usefulness of looking in your studies and your methods, the degree to which it moves those processes. If other ones need to be added, what needs to be added? And let's come into a conversation that allows us Mm -hmm. to develop that in the interests of those that we serve, not in the interests of our castles in the sky and, you know, the buildings we peed on. Excuse Mm -hmm. me for the metaphor. (laughs) And how do you see the relationship between ACT and compassion or self-compassion? You write in the book, compassion is a hallmark of a spiritual well-being. And you mentioned self-compassion in the process of processing experience, like painful memories, let's say. But, you know. Well, I, you know, self-acceptance, the way I mean it, 
emotional openness from this transcendent sense of self, etc. And then it's social extension, but the self compassion doesn't you're not yet there really is pretty darn close. So you can use self-kindness as another way of talking about a better way than acceptance because acceptance is often used as an epithet. You just need to accept it. Mm-hmm, right. I don't like feeling what I feel when I see you feel what you feel. You know, people have that done to them all the time. And it makes a great acronym and the root etymology of acceptance is wonderful. To receive as if to receive a gift. Cemetery. That's still in our English. Here, would you accept this when you give a precious gift? Emotions are a precious gift. Here, would you accept this? this is a really good question. But it's heard as would you tolerate this? Would you resign yourself to this? Could you put up with this? So, when we've done studies of let's take the self compassion scale, and self compassion scale works really, really well, I can send you some studies that if you then look at the psychological flexibility processes, and you pull the variance out in multiple mediator models or in shared variance. If there's science geeks here, you know how to do that. What's left behind basically doesn't predict anything positive. So self-compassion and self-kindness is an even better way, I think, to orient you quickly to what the essence is of opening yourself up to your own experience in consciousness and then bringing that into connection with others. And so we're fellow travelers and I like the concept and I like the methods and I want ACT folks to feel really empowered and free to play in that space because we're really close to the same journey. There's such a proliferation of constructs in psychology and there's not a shared vocabulary and it gets really, really confusing, I think. Well, this is another, it's in the liberated mind just a little bit, but this is another place we're going, which is with my colleague Stefan Hoffman and some others. I'm trying to open up the field of evidence based therapy to what's called process based therapy, which is to stop with all the trademark labels for techniques, focus on processes of change. And the way that we've tried to come up with a common language that's not hegemonistic because no one theory can do it. You, you, people have their own heroes, et cetera. You, it's not fair. It's not right. I don't want to go into a CBT and say, don't talk about that, talk about this. You know, I mean, even though I'm at an odd wing of CBT, never mind analytic, humanistic, existential, and so on, is we've tried to put it inside evolution signs. And we're making some real progress there. And it's helpful because I've never met a scientist who wants to say, but what I'm doing doesn't have anything to do with evolution. Now, they usually have only thought about it in terms of genetic evolution. But it turns out variation, selection, retention in context in multiple dimensions at multiple levels works wonderfully in the life sciences. And by the way, psychology and the rest are life sciences. It's just we haven't gotten the message yet. And so that's my hope of find consilience by thinking of how to embed it in the queen of the theories of the life sciences, which is uh, an extended evolutionary synthesis that's modern and allows evolution to be purposive and conscious. Not in a woo -woo way, you know, we're going to childhood's end, you know, uh, we'll sail off, you know, like corporal being. I don't (laughs) want to go there. But I do want to go to a place where I can say, you know, we need a human culture that can step up to the challenge of climate change, gender bias, and uh, racism. We need that. How could we evolve that? And it turns out the therapists are working on processes that are part of the answer. That's an empirical fact. That's awesome. The mindfulness folks are working on something that's part of that answer. That's wonderful. What do you see as the sort of cutting edge of ACT now, or what are you most excited about where ACT is going? Well, where ACT is going heavily in a process direction, that's one, which is allowing us to draw on compassion work, for example, or mindfulness methods of all, of all kinds, but not just that, you know, more social level processes. So one of the things I've been working on is how to scale ACT, psychological flexibility, into dyads, small groups, and communities. And with my uh, colleague, uh, David Sloan Wilson, and uh, Paul Atkins at Australian Catholic University, we have a protocol called ProSocial, which is based on ACT plus Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize winning core design principles. 
uh, this won the Nobel for in 2009, showing that indigenous peoples can protect their forests, lakes, rivers, and streams forever without either private ownership, greed is good, invisible hand, or top-down command and control government regulation. We've been doing it through evolutionary processes as the kind of social monkeys that know how to cooperate to protect things. We know how to do that. And so we're that's an example of scaling it into social and community work that has been done in uh, the Ebola crisis. I tell that story at the end of A Liberated Mind. There's a new study that the World Health Organization has done with South Sudanese refugees in Uganda using an act cartoon book and an audio tape delivered by people who, who are indigenous health workers who may not even have a high school education with effect sizes as large as what we get in the West. And so if you go to the World Health Organization and you find out, ask about COVID, they will, for the first time, give you, uh, it's called Self Help Plus. That's how you find it. They don't want to be talking about act, 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 but it's an app protocol. You can get this, the free thing and download it, and they'd say use it for help deal with COVID. So where it's going, I think, is that, and if I mention one more, I would like to take, and I think this is the same spirit of what John Cabot Zinn has done and so forth, take these kinds of processes into the gatekeeper areas. What? Well, for example, empowering workers, diversity training, uh, helping with uh, classroom management, you know, sports coaching, sales. And it turns out we have randomized trials in that because we're pretty good at randomized trials. We're up to almost 400 of them. We're sitting on maybe three, 4,000 studies. You know, we're, we're pretty productive. We're putting them into baseball teams. And, you know, I'm not wearing my Blue Jays shirt, but <laughs> all Blue Jays' entire mental performance team is all act all the time. The influencers, the folks who really have a direct voice to the culture, are not the scientists, just a few. They're not the therapists. Even with COVID, we're hardly even mentioned. You know, don't touch your face. How do you do that? Well, you'd think a psychologist might be on the screen. Nope. Nope. An epidemiologist, just don't touch it. <laughs> you, haven't they, were they ever parents? Do you know what happens when you tell them? Just do stuff. It's a train wreck. And we're seeing the train wreck, right? I'm not like that. You can't make me. Oh, gosh. Like, why do they should have consulted the psychologist first? I think what's ahead of us is the exciting journey of putting evidence based processes of change that liberate the human mind into human culture in a way that all hands on deck. What you're doing matters. This podcast does a bit. Yeah, That book that's being written does a little bit. And we keep our eye not just on the one out of five mental illness, but on the five out of five needs of people to be lifted up by evidence-based processes that promote their prosperity and alleviate their suffering. Beautiful. Well, it's just such a wonderful place to stop, I think. <laughs> There were some awesome questions, some awesome chat. Thanks for letting me be part of your journey. It's a pleasure. And what is the best way for people to stay in touch with what you're up to? Well, if they want to follow my work more narrowly, if you go to stephenchays.com, you can click on yes, please send it to me, and then you get my newsletter. I don't spam people. It goes out once a month or so, but it kind of keeps you in track of what I'm doing. And, and yes, some of it is like, books I've written, things like that, too, but, but uh, not in a spammy way. But people can also simply Google acceptance and commitment therapy or acceptance and commitment training. We call it that when we're dealing with sports and things like that that are not really therapy settings. And you'll find Facebook things. There's a groups.io group that's gone on for 10 years of about 2,000 people in it having a conversation. There's a scientific community. So the, the supports are out there for low cost or no cost. People can download and you know guides and the youtube videos there's uh, etc but if they want to follow me qua me uh, go to stephenchays.com if you have a broader interest in how this fits with your personal journey uh, just uh, look at uh, what's out there and acceptance and commitment therapy or psychological flexibility and uh, a few minutes on your favorite search engine will give you more than you have time to explore 
at this point, you could probably type act plus pretty much any concern or question or whatever and find somebody who's written or thought or said something about well, it. Well, I actually do that with Google Scholar. Like if you're more evidence focused, put in acceptance, recommended therapy or acceptance, recommended training, and then anything you're interested in. And then with that, contribute to it if you're, if you're of a mind to, if you're something you care about that you don't find, think about it. How would these processes there? Because as far as I know, Everywhere the human mind goes, these processes are relevant. And that's been the, the voice of the mindfulness traditions from the beginning. Uh, let's bring it into the Western world and uh, the specific problems we're facing. Well, thanks again. This was just wonderful. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, we hope you'll hit subscribe, leave us a great rating or review, and spread the word. You can also go to noblemindpodcast.com to join our email list. You'll get a weekly behind-the-scenes message, news, announcements, and other special goodies we come up with just for you. Thanks for listening, and bye for now.